Hello, and welcome to Wyverns and Weirdos Fathomless, a D&D podcast set in the world of Fiela. I'm your Dungeon Master Darby, and joining me as always are Eddie, playing Tibble, Mitch, playing Neris, Laura, playing Rue, Joe, playing Alton, Emily, playing Cerise, and Zoe, playing Loren. Let's jump into it. we last left off, the crew of the Polaris were dealing with the repercussions of some old actions of Alton's catching up to him uh, and the aftermath of the battle in the street and taking captive the, uh, the officer who was attempting to assassinate uh, the, the elf. Uh, after some questioning, they found out a bit about Alton's past um, and about the very meticulous uh, boss of the officer come assassin that was hunting him down. They eventually let uh, Crow go um, with some discussion and some uh, dealings being made um, and there was a lot to do to made about um, proper procedure on Tibble's part. Uh, meanwhile, I believe the other major thing was talking to uh, Cerise and a uh, Loren regarding uh, various things I, and we return to uh, where we left which was Rue and Neris uh, making their way back to the ship after Neris's discussion with Loren and a reminder to Cerise that uh, Tibble would like to finish the conversation that was interrupted. So, Ru and Eris, is there anything you want to cover on your way back to the ship? Um, <clears throat> so Neris um, and Ru were having a little bit of a conversation as they left the ship. Um, and I think after that, Neris would be quiet for probably the next four or five minutes or so. Um, before if the silence is unbroken. Yeah, Rue would be pretty quiet as well. Um, so just plodding along after, um, yeah, after, after Neris, after the, um, <laughs> slightly tense uh, end to the conversation with um, Loren specifically. Um, but they don't seem uncomfortable as they were earlier. Um, more contemplative perhaps is perhaps the aura you might feel around him. Um, Neris would just kind of um, plod along a little bit, kind of um, pull up his collar and sort of um, wrap himself up a little bit tighter to try and trap a little bit of warmth. Um, and is then going to look over at Rue. Do you mind if I asked you a question? 
Rue tilts his head to one side. Um, the sort of like uh, lights behind the uh, mask, the sort of like glasses, like sort of shutter as if they were blinking. I do not. It depends upon the question. So you might as well ask it. Then we will find out together, I guess. Of course. How do you think that went? With your friends on the ship. With With the Ren. With the people on the ship, yes. I am quite curious. It seemed to go well, as you said. There were some things revealed that perhaps would not have been. And you certainly seemed to cause a bit of a stir. Was that your intention? I am never a a huge fan of poking the hornet's nest, if you will. Um, It does tend to result in being stung. Yes, it can. However, sometimes I found it is necessary. If you want to learn how the hornets behave. Interesting. I think it certainly painted an interesting picture of a few different sides of the wren, at least. May I ask, then, were all your questions purely in an academical sense, a scientific test to see how she would respond? Or do you have a particular interest in the storm of magic that was born into someone? I have a... (laughs) Myself and the crew of the Polaris, uh, before we arrived at Acheron, had an encounter with sentient storm elemental creatures. I have not encountered those in the past. I do not believe the encounter went incredibly well. And it did seem to catch us all off guard, so I would like to investigate and learn as much as I can so that if there is a problem in the near future or this is a continuing issue that seems to grow then I would be in a much better position to handle it. You can correct the path of viewing your own death in plane, then. In plane. That is a good and a good cause, and I can always admire gathering scientific research and evidence and hypothesis to test, to prepare for the future. Interesting. You have spoken, Neris, about how you see through paths that can be taken and have visions of things that may occur. I... And then Rue kind of, like, looks to in the direction of where the ship is, um, like where the Polaris is, is docked, whether it's in view or whether it's in the direction of where where it is, perhaps with some clouds sort of like obscuring the moon as um, they look in that direction and then they sort of like turn back and look at um, Nera's and their eyes sort of like gleam sort of like a sort of a sea blue for a moment um, 
and again shutter and then back into that sort of like bright white um i don't dream often i have no need for it i don't sleep i don't breathe i don't eat i don't need to dream i rest sometimes but sometimes the molecules and atoms of magic that comprise the crystalline workings of my core twist into a shape where I have something like a dream when I'm at rest normally when I seek to see how my own path is travelling I have stones that I follow sometimes and sometimes well I have been thinking about what I spoke to you earlier about the events of today and my distaste of them. Before I left Acheron, I spoke to the stones and I had a vision in broad daylight as I was leaving. Tibble was speaking, I did not hear him. Something clouded my vision and I saw the underneath of an ocean deeper than I'd ever seen but I was below it and then then I saw my mentor figure Ezzet who disappeared so, so long ago now and I felt he was near and then it shifted again and I was on a ship that I did not recognize. And I was surrounded by the crew of the Polaris. We were approaching something in the distance. I don't know what it was. And that faded, that dream during the day was gone. But it felt a little bit like a threat of the future. So I think regardless, your advice is correct. Seeing how I can correct the path of others, of the Polaris, in the future, and how I can behave to improve that and to help others is the path I must take currently. If only to see what that vision might mean, be it a dream or a memory of the future. Speaking, of course, to someone who seems to have some understanding of these things. And they sort of like tilt their head to one, like cock it like a, like a bird does, which is what they do quite often. And sort of just like observe over Nera's the blank sort of stare so Nerus is quiet for a little bit as he's kind of thinking about this so there are not many who receive visions or images of the future and fewer still who understand their true meaning then it's very fortunate I've crossed your path perhaps perhaps we'll find out Perhaps. After all, it might just be a flight of fancy, and I will come to regret this decision. But for now, there are a great many deals of people that I can help, and things to learn about people, of storms, and f paths, and feelings, and other things. 
it sounds almost like you have made a decision about your future path. I think so. I think for now, as long as the Polaris will have me, I will remain. Is this something you disagree with? Or something you think is a right possible path towards the future? I, I have not. never approach things with a great deal of certainty. My mentor and the one before him were all so much better at it. But I have an insatiable curiosity. And he kind of like does like a little like like head wiggle kind of thing, which he usually does when he's like cheerful, like when we talk about the opera. You can kind of like feel it. He's, he's like kind of being a bit jovial, or, like, joking. Neris does give a very fleeting smile. Um, it is not the decisions that I disagree with. Um, however, as I said, it is not a decision that I should be making. This is your decision to make. If you believe this is the path to your future, the one that you have seen in your vision, if that is what you wish to strive for, then by all means, take it. I am... I would be more than um, happy to assist with any future visions along it's potentially trying to disentangle the prior ones you have had. I would be very pleased to do so. And then Ru kind of like looks at like um the ship that we may have approached by this point, and like the, the the cloud passes where the moonlight is. Um and then looks back down at like Nero's with like sort of like this like intense kind of like that that, that white blue but very intense. I hope you have a good night, Mr. Narrows. I've appreciated this walk and the observations. So have I. So I have been enlightening. Um, meanwhile, Alton, how are you dealing with your evening? Having, having, a, having a riot, having a party. Um, Alton, uh, he would have very much, like, uh, tried to keep himself away from everyone. Um, he just sort of slowly just walked back to his room, probably trying to avoid anyone's gaze, and he just looks beat. He is just exhausted. Um, he heads into his room, and uh, Alton's room is kind of... Um, it's very bare bones. It has very few possessions. It's very much just like how it kind of came with the ship. Um, there's probably only personal items around. Uh, there's uh, medical supplies. Um, there's some notes a little about and some notes in like a fantasy binder um, that is all written in under common. Um, and there's also maybe like one or two weapons that he's been fixing um, and uh, an embroidery piece that he's working on. Um, he'll head over to his bed and just kind of like uh, grab some uh, medical supplies, uh, take off his shirt and uh, have a look at uh, the gunshot wounds that he's got. They're kind of like not hurting. They haven't been hurting like too bad. They're doing decently, but they are not, they're still there. Um, I'd like to roll a medicine check to see what's going on because his max HP went down. Uh, yep, uh, that's a 21. Um, 21 is probably uh, 
you're probably doing reasonably well. Um, but yeah, it's concerning, but you feel like it's nothing that a rest won't kind of help you to recover from. Okay, okay. Okay. You'll kind of like look at it and maybe like, I don't know, take a sample from the blood or something to see if he can analyze that later and then just start bandaging himself up. Um, he's also uh, a very like heavily scarred, mostly around like the torso. He's got um, like burn scarring over a fair amount of his torso and probably the odd like wounds, like the knife slashes um, quite noticeably. Um all across his right arm, he has a sleeve tattoo that is this, there's like lines of varying width that is it's just like semi abstract, but it uh, takes up like the ripples on a lake on water and that's going across his entire arm. And he probably has a, he has a couple of other like little tattoos here and there as well. Um, as he's uh, patching himself up, uh, Rat, uh, like, scuttles along, scuttles up to him from the floor. <laughs> Just like, squeak, squeak. <laughs> I'm so excited to see him back. And he'll just kind of, like, probably, like, sighing from the effort, like, lean over and grab, like, um, a broccoli, the cut-up broccoli stem and feed that to him. <laughs> um... And just sit for a moment, uh, feeding rat. And then once, after a little bit, take the noticeable effort to stand up again and start going about the room uh, with a backpack and just shoveling things in. So he's going to take like um, extra bit of like a pouch of money that he's gotten hidden like under a, a, a desk. Um, he's going to take like steps of clothing, um, more medical supplies, of course, more weaponry and just shove that all into the backpack and then he's gonna go and once again not enjoying the physical movement um kind of like semi like crawl under the bed and fish out from under like a broken floorboard what looks like a, sh a small like uh bundle it looks like something thin that's wrapped in oil cloth he'll take that out quickly have a look look through the sheets of paper and then shove that into the backpack as well and um, once this is all done you're just gonna like pop this within arm's reach and then finally just collapse onto the bed just looking completely weary just physically everything taking a huge toll on him but also just emotionally just absolutely exhausted and he's just going to plop down and look up the ceiling. And with a kind of like a wry, like exasperated look in his face, just be like, oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> hey, this all you're doing. <laughs> Why don't you just get on with it? I am so tired. And then he'll just roll over and try very hard to sleep <laughs> as Rat kind of just nibbles away at his on some broccoli by his feet. And he has his getaway bag right by his side. And that's what Alvin will do for the evening. Oh. Um, Tibble. Tibble is currently sorting um, through some things in the corner of his quarters. It's probably by that point um, you hear a like the like the kind of like heavy tread of like some because I'd like Rue isn't like because Rue is not a robot. They're an Adam doll, um, but they have a lot of mechanical pieces to them. And there's a lot of like, just like clicking and like just grinding of like some kind of like stone or just like the pure raw magic that is making them exist, I suppose. Um, and so you like hear the, 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 the fairly heavy tread of something quite large and heavy outside the door that just sort of like just stops there for a couple of beats as if it's contemplating. And then like does one knock? 
and then contemplates a little bit more, like in a couple of seconds, even if Tibble's running over to open the door, and then just kind of does like a long scratch of like the door, like with like that's something with like long sort of like hard thing fingers would do. Um, so you would hear a little bit of clambering, um, the sound of a few things sort of being shifted about um before Tibble swings the door open um and he looks up at you and he's like uh he looks a little bit frazzled like he was somewhat startled by um your appearance not like your physical appearance but the fact that you um actually showed up yeah and then very quickly kind of like withdraws his hand and like sort of just does that sort of like more gangly sort of posing that he seems to do when he's cl- clearly appearing trying to look more unassuming and meek yeah and Tibble um he looks up at Rue and he's like ah yes um Rue my lad apologies for um the state of myself come in come in and he kind of shuffles you in um, opening the door. Rue, uh, the, the, the rooms are pretty big, but Rue still stoops under, like, the, um, the door frame and then kind of just, like, looks around slowly. <laughs> the little lamplight eyes kind of just shuttering a bit as they look around. So is this, um, and forgive my own memory, is this the first time that Rue has actually been in Tibble's quarters? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Um, so what Rue would notice, um, is a number of different things. The first thing is that all of the beds, furniture, everything in the room is about a third smaller than what you would see for the larger folk. So, um, it kind of looks like a little bit of a room of miniatures where um, it almost looks like some form of museum display. Um, Everything takes up a lot less room than it would. So uh, different sections of the room are divided um, to have more things in them than they generally would be able to fit. So the bed itself um, is a fair bit smaller, um, only about four feet long. um, And it's a beautiful double bed with lots of silken sheets. Um, In one corner of the room, uh, you see Kara and she waves to you um, as she is standing at an easel, quite a small easel, and she's sketching um, something in charcoal that you can't quite make out. It seems like it's early stages. And you can see that um, the pads of her paws um, are dusted in soot from the charcoal, as well as some um, markings on the fur of her face where she is um, absentmindedly uh, touched at her face. And in that corner of the room, you would see a large overflowing cabinet of various things. In one section, um, there's very clearly a bunch of apothecary things. Um, in another section, there's various craft and art things. Um, and it just seems like there's a lot of different activities that are there to take up time as well as a desk where you can see she um, has a few things written down and scattered and she gives you a sort of half absent-minded wave and a soft smile. Um, In the corner across from there, you can see a desk filled with papers as well as a shelf above the desk that has various somewhat disorganized volumes of what you can see in tiny little um, calligraphied handwriting along the spine of these um, hand-bound journals, captain's log, written, dated with various um, years. You also see another um, wooden almost filing cabinet style shelves where um, scrawled on the front in magical arcane writing is um, 
reports for the Hydra. And you could most likely tell um, that that would be locked arcanically, arcanely <laughs> locked. Um, but as you follow Tibble, you see that he actually goes to the other half of the room, which is mostly empty. There's um, one larger folk size couch and another um, couch that is clearly the one that him and Kara use um, if they are ever just sitting and, you know, having breakfast in their room. Um, there's a small uh, table as well as um, what looks like a table that can be moved around to be sat in front of the big people <laughs> um, couch. And then tucked on the other side of the room, you see a bunch of belongings. Um, now, none of these really look like they necessarily fit here, but you can see that um, they have been put very particularly in place. So um, everything looks like it's as safe and secure as it could be. Um, but you can see that there are some um, belongings and documents that Tibble uh, must have been in the middle of sorting out um, as you arrived. And emotions for you to um, have a seat on the larger couch as he um, sits uh, on the other one that is adjacent to it in the corner. My apologies. It took so long to arrange the meeting. I hope you're not too fatigued, Captain. It has been a big day. Not at all, Ru. I was, um, I was up anyways, um, and... Kara was also. I would have been keeping her company even if I wasn't. But in the middle of shifting some things. And he looks My a little bit somber. <laughs> he looks a little bit somber as he um, says that. And when you say that, Kara kind of turns. She catches Tibble's eye um, and just uh, quickly signs something half heartedly. And Tibble translates to you. He's like, she says not to be worried. You're not a bother. Yes. I appreciate it then. Thank you very much for your kind spirits. Well, it would be uh, quite unkind if we weren't to partake you at this hour, considering I invited you. But um, thank you. For coming, Ru. I know it's a late hour and it's been a busy day for yourself as well. The trust of my crew is something that is very important to me and Alton is new and still fresh to learning and has been hurt before. And I'm trying to help him be able to trust again. Your kindness towards Alton is a good merit. Maybe. We'll see, but... It's one that I don't regret. And Rue, I, I want to make it clear, and I don't know how this will paint me, but I don't regret what's happened today. There are some aspects that I wish had been done differently. However... I believe that the people who I travel with, the crew that I have with me, no matter what background others place upon them, it is their choice on how they deal with the future. And we all always have a choice. I would much rather take the burden of the harder parts of the choice than have my crew have to go through anything more than what they already have had to. But does it change the outcome if you take the suffering onto yourself? Sometimes it's not my suffering to have. Sometimes it's suffering they have to have on their own, and that's fine. But sometimes suffering can be stifling. 
and I may look small, but I've got stronger shoulders than um, most. And I would much rather bear the responsibility of what may come of me putting my trust in my crew and looking out for my crew than them not be given the opportunities that they might otherwise. I have that seniority, I have that position of power, so I'm going to use it to help. Not a single one of them are lesser than me just because they're not the captain. Nor yourself. I guess it leads on in a way. Um, I wanted to make sure you were still comfortable with myself and with my crew after the events of today because um, I spoke to the Hydra and um, I mentioned that I was bringing aboard a guest that you would be ongoing for as long as you would like. For the time that you're here, um, due to some rather untasteful circumstances, um, some of the junior crew, well, at least one of the junior crew are being promoted. There is a temporary position upon board, if you'll have it. I've seen how you can protect others and how you come to their aid. Of course. I don't think, well, I can't speak for Alton, but I think having another medic can't hurt. You will see. Either way, Captain Tibble the Polaris, today is your lucky day. I would be delighted to join. On the provisio that if I do not agree or something, I will bring it up. Does that work well for you? Of course. I um I wanted to hear your thoughts before um giving you the official onboarding, I guess, but this crew's a little different, and I suppose there's likely aspects of what you sort today that would suggest differently, but I like my crew to be open with me. I want my crew to disagree with me sometimes. I'm here to lead, not to dictate. I want, if I ask something of my crew, for them to follow me because they trust me and because they agree with me rather than just blindly following. So I would ask you to please, if you disagree, come forward. If you're not comfortable coming forward to me, any of my senior officers would happily hear you out. Of course. I will make sure I do that in the future, if there is any problems. Wonderful. Um, and Timo kind of scratches at his nose a little bit, and he's like, there is one other thing that I wanted to, well, show you, I guess, before, um, well, I let you retire for the evening. Yes. Until um, he kind of gets up from the smaller couch and he goes over to where some of the belongings are um, uh, neatly piled and goes into the sort of area of belongings that he seemed to be gently sorting. And um, he looks around and then grabs this um, silken mesh bag and it's quite large and it seems um almost enchanted in a way um but you can't quite tell how and he says um no i have put these away for safekeeping and 
Rue, I am trusting you a lot. And he's holding this bag. He's like, back when we were, well, at your home, there were a few items that at the time I recognized, but I couldn't quite put my finger on how. Well, I guess it's easiest just to show you. And he um, opens up the drawstring on this shimmering sort of sheer looking bag and um, gestures for you to put your hands out. Rue looks like very like um, their eyes sort of like widen a little bit um, and like sort of like the dark stuff like shutters in as if they're like focusing and they stretch their long fingered clawed hand out. Um, Tibble very gently starts to pour uh, these beautiful shards of sea glass into your hands. Uh, I hope you don't mind me asking, but are you a religious sort, Rue? I don't know. Janus, he was... He prayed to, um, well, a specific ocean god. An ocean god that I believe, well, he spoke to using these. I see. Stones from the ocean floor. Or from somewhere else entirely. I am. Um, when we were in your home, I saw that you had similar. Yes, I collected some from the that have washed ashore, and also from a time I too was at the bottom of the ocean. These are very interesting. They seem to have. A great deal of significance. I have used mine to correct my paths, shall we say. I can't imagine what power these have. May I? You said this was a great trust you were in laying me. Am I able to observe these? I am. Um, I would very much like if you would, Ru, but um, on the proviso that please let me know what you find. Of course, as I said, I don't know if I'm a religious man, if that is a word you could use. But I will certainly let you know if something important can be gleaned from them. Thank you for entrusting me as your captain. You can see Kara has actually, um, for a while, stopped her sketching. Um, she, I think you would expect her to be watching you, but instead she's watching Tibble. And there's a really soft, almost sad expression on her face. <laughs> And when you look at the charcoal drawing, um, you can now make it out and it's quite <laughs> tumultuous. To, to, I can't say the word. <laughs> tumultuous um, waves crashing against a boat in a storm. And it looks almost haunting, almost like it's still moving. Rude look notices this for a while and so just says, a very apt drawing. I will leave you to retire. Thank you for the chat. I hope you both sleep very well tonight. Uh, 
Loren and Cerise, is there anything that the two of you are doing this evening? When uh, Neris and Rue left, Loren probably just like sat there glaring at the door for a bit, like a chin in her hand. That bastard's up to something. What is he up to? And then she's gonna just get up and walk to Cerise's room and just... Captain! There is the vague murmur of voices behind the door. Not again! Where'd you the find moment. them this time? Before Cerise says, Enter! At me own risk. She opens the door. And as you walk in, she's very quickly putting something away in a drawer. But there is no one with her. <sighs> what can I help you with this time? I, that conversation, that, that weedy little bastard's up to something, isn't he? Of course he is. For what? He's not as smart as he thinks he is, so what does he think he's found? He was, he was asking leading questions, right? He got me to admit that I've got, I've been touched by a siren. Like, well, shut up, I was. Didn't tell him the whole truth, but that was correct. <sighs> Who's to say it's anything to do with you? What do you mean? He may just want information for getting information, and the fact that it gets under your skin is a bonus. Well, no, that can't be his reasoning, because that's my reasoning. And if he and I have the same reasoning, that means we're on the same page, and that makes me want to throw up in my mouth a little bit. Like... You're both more alike than you think. Oh, don't say that, Captain. Don't insult me while I'm having a moment. Well, you both think you're smarter than you are. Captain! Don't think I'm that smart. <clears throat> Come now. I'm good at what I do. I never said I was a genius. Why are you... What? What? Have I got something on my face? Well, yes, you've always got something on your face, but... As I said... We're just... Keeping an eye on what they're all up to. You know, pretend to be chummy for a bit. So... What if he is thinking of something, though? <laughs> Says Eirik. <laughs> Loudly in the background. What if he... Captain... What if I revealed too much and he's worked out her? How could he wor have worked that out from what little you gave? I don't know. I'm just panicking. But if he finds out about her, then we're in big trouble. I'm in big trouble. Perhaps you need to learn to... Keep control of your emotions so as to not expose too much. 
need to be more careful if you don't want it exposed. I have been careful. Just... You no. went for a swim, we're at port. How is that careful? I was on the other side of the ship. We're still at port. There are other ships out the other side. Well, not... Um... I know what I'm doing, Captain. I know this area. My family's not far from here. I know how to be visible only to the crew. If he's seen things he wasn't meant to see, it's because he's been poking his nose in it. And if he's been poking his nose, I need to know where. He does seem to sort to poke his nose in things. I. It's a wonder that thing isn't more crooked. It should have been broken by now. Maybe it's been broken so many times it's just sort of back in shape at the moment. Maybe. Though he looks the sort, if I threw a fish at him, it'd probably break his whole face. Probably shatter a, shatter a cheekbone with a sardine if propelled correctly. Say a sardine would be too much. Kipper probably better. I Probably just the bait you use to catch a kipper. That'd knock him right over. It's just been a weird day. I don't want anybody leaving the ship unless expressly permitted by me. Aye, aye. We're only going to stay here for another day or two until our supplies are fully stopped. Then we're out of here. Business today. I don't like it. Captain, when you said the Sin Seekers taking the big fella, you mean he's gone, right? If they've taken him, it means they need him for something. So you mean I braided this stupid pointy thing into my hair for nothing? Doesn't mean he won't come back. Perhaps not in the way that some people might want. I think it's best we be careful when we leave as well. Aye. They're getting more bold and they're up to something. The Polaris? No, the Sin Seekers. You're not wrong. Broad daylight kidnapping from the war room of a ship? That's a pretty big deal. We only saw them a few days ago. No, oh, a week. What's what's time? I say we leave port. Might be time to do some investigating of our own. Carefully. You know me, Captain, on the picture I care. I want all the senior officers in the meeting room in the morning. Time to plan. I'll let them all know. And thank you, Captain. I'll be more careful. We made an oath, didn't we? We don't call on her. I swear by it, and I'll stick with it. Thank you. All right, I'll let you get back to whatever romance book you were reading aloud to yourself. Or was it that weirdo that lives in your head again? He finds it amusing that you think that. What, that he's a weirdo? He is. He lives in your head. I don't know his name. I don't know what he looks like. I just know he gives you your little zappy powers. Or was it funny that I think is a romance book if I put my foot in it again? I'll just go. I'll go, actually, Captain. Have a good evening. Good night. So, as everyone in their respective rooms settles in for the night and finds sleep taking them, Neris, you find yourself standing in a vast desert. You hear a sound from behind you akin to a stream of sand falling below the surface. When you turn around to face the sound, you see two things. 
The first is a sort of dip in the sand, almost like a slow moving whirlpool. The second is a man standing on the opposite side of it. He's dressed darkly, predominantly in blacks, though with some hints of green. His hair, though it shows signs of once being brown, is more grey and white than it was in youth. And his face. That's where it becomes apparent who this man is. Look around you, young man. Your older self cautions you. The sands of time are running out. You are not far off the crossroads, and you must be prepared when you reach it. What must I do? That I cannot tell you. I am disrupting too much doing this. But... You will know when the time comes. Is this place familiar to us? These are the sands of time. For me, they are falling apart. That is why I am reaching out even though it would break the very seams of reality to do so. What does that matter when the seams of reality are already falling apart? I beg of you, do not fail like I did. I will not be able to do this again, though you may receive visitations from those like us studying the magics that we do. There is certain consistencies uh, and certain abilities that it leads itself to. But it also takes us down many paths. careful you don't take the wrong one. Did you... Did you try too hard or not hard enough? I don't know if I can say. It is not something that I could answer with confidence. Maybe I did too much, but maybe I did too little. I was. I will do everything that I can to give us both the future you deserved. My future is nothing. My reality is falling apart, but uh, I warn you so that yours does not suffer the same fate. There are many degrees of infinity. And while it is true that reality, that time, that timelines are infinite, there is a limit 
to that infinity. It is not as boundless as some would be naive to believe it to be. There are infinite possibilities within those limits. There are only so many paths that can be taken when choices are made. When... When does this start? has already started and that is where you wake up and that is where we're gonna leave it for this week scream <laughs> wow thank wow you for listening. to ponder on that one yes thank you for listening everyone thank tell you. us your thoughts mm. <laughs> see you next have a week. good week everyone thanks guys awesome. thank you. bye sense of time are unraveling. <laughs> I mean, that was mint. That was when does the start? It already has. You wake up. Ah! Said you didn't. Um, said you didn't throw in a um, Days of Our Lives reference. <laughs> <laughs> the Disappointed in you. <laughs> like sands <laughs> through the hourglass. Uh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so,